and join us there. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Bill. Thank you. All right, so I will be introducing this week's seminar speaker, Dr. Tim Tinker. So Tim is a research wildlife biologist and an adjunct professor with UC Santa Cruz and Dalhousie University in Halifax, where he currently lives. And Tim is formerly with the USGS, where he co-led a sea otter research lab, which was a joint lab between UC Santa Cruz and USGS. Uh, and so today, Tim is going to be talking about some of the spatial and foraging ecology of sea otters. And he's going to be building off some of this research that he's done on sea otters in California, Russia, and Alaska. Alaska. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, without further ado, yeah. Yeah, not, not Oregon yet. Can you go green, Tim? Can you go green? Go green, right, yes. Well, thanks all for, um, well, for being here today on this lovely day. I'm surprised you're not all out hiking. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's great to be here and um, see a lot of some faces I know, and a lot of new faces. So yeah, I'm going to be talking to you today about um, some of the findings. That today is not going to be talking about any one study. It's going to be sort of a synthesis of a lot of work we've done over the last 20, 25 years um, in, well, in a lot of different populations around the North Pacific where sea otters occur. And I'm going to be talking to you about some of the sort of puzzles that we've been faced with and at least somewhat solved by getting a better understanding of the spatial scale at which sea otter populations um, exist at. And hopefully, um, by the end of the day, I will have convinced you that, that taking these issues of spatial scale into consideration for sea otters and probably other species um, is a very important thing to do to understand population dynamics. So I'm going to start with a little brief history, um, although probably most of you are familiar with this, but, um, but I don't want to assume anything. So. Um, brief history of sea otter po population biology and conservation around the North Pacific. So sea otters, oh yeah, I can't point at that screen. Sea otters um, historically occurred around the North Pacific Rim in this map here. You can see, see that yellow band um, from Hokkaido, Japan, um, up um, Kamchatka Peninsula, the Aleutian Islands, and then all down the west coast of North America as far as Baja, California. Um, and this was their distribution um, at the beginning of the fur trade in 1750. Um, the, from the, over the next 150 odd years, they were reduced to near extinction, extinction by the North Pacific maritime fur trade. Um, and that occurred in sort of a West East fashion. So um, the Commander Islands, the Russian waters first, then the Aleutian <coughs> Islands, and then they worked their way down and finishing um, in Southern California. So by 1911, when they were protected by international treaty, um, sea otters were, had been eliminated from almost all of their former range. And the little red dots that you see on this map show the areas that were reasonably certain based on subsequent patterns of um, population recovery that there must have been remnant populations. But though in, um, from the sort of historical records at the time, some of these were probably only about a dozen animals. So it, it's thought that there were only a few hundred to maybe um, a thousand or a couple thousand at most otters worldwide at that time. So they were really almost brought to the um, verge of extinction. Um, and then they're protected and then they began to recover. And they, um, over the course of the next hundred years, was really a pattern of recovery. And that recovery, of course, occurred from these small remnant populations. Uh, and that means that the, the population sort of radiated out from all those, um, from those points. And that led to this very discontinuous pattern of recovery, which is really important, as you'll see, for, um, for some of our understanding of population dynamics and ecology of sea otters. So I'm going to talk to you today about several of these, as I mentioned, long-standing puzzles about sea otter population dynamics and their patterns of recovery um, in various populations. Um, and these are long-standing puzzles really from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, right through the present. There's a lot of research conducted trying to understand the answers of these puzzles. And as you'll see by the end of the talk, we, we now understand that many of the hypotheses we had were fundamentally flawed because of our misunderstanding of the spatial scale of sea otter populations. So the first puzzle I'm going to talk about um, is this fundamental one. And that is that different populations recovered and expanded um, their former habitats at very different rates. Um, and that formed this sort of fundamental question of why some populations were recovering slowly and some populations seemed to be recovering very quickly and why that would be. 
Um, another puzzle um, refers, uh, uh, corresponds to sort of the things that we've seen more recently. And that is, we, in some regions, we've seen um, a lot of spatial variation in trends at relatively small scales. Um, we've also seen uh, effects of mortality events that seem to be reflected at very small scales. But then in other areas, um, such as southwest Alaska, where we saw, uh, we saw very rapid and continuous decline occur over a really huge geographic range. So other regions seem to exhibit very highly consistent trends over big scales, uh, while other regions show very highly variable trends at small scales. And so again, this was a puzzle as to what was causing this, um, this disjunct. So I'm going to start with the first puzzle, um, variation in rates of recovery. So as mentioned, some northern populations, um, when, they be, when they were protected by um, international treaty and they began to recover after the fur trade, um, from the time that the first surveys were conducted through the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, um, seemed to be recovering at close to or right at the theoretical R max for the population. So if you, if you take down sort of a basic life history schedule for sea otters, plug it into a matrix and figure out how fast they can grow, it comes to about 20 to 25 percent maximum given their life history. And that seemed to be the rate at which a lot of these populations were recovering, including um, some places in the, some of the Aleutian Islands, Southeast Alaska, Washington, and BC. Now, those latter three, um, those latter three populations I've just mentioned, were um, those populations were established based on translocations. So otters were taken from Amchika Island, Prince William Sound, brought to those areas, and then those translocated populations, once they became established, um, just took off and began to grow at, as I say, close to the theoretical R max. In contrast, other populations, particularly California, although there were um, some other populations that also grew slowly, but California was the one that really um, led to this big puzzle as to why it was growing so, so poorly. Um, it seemed over the uh, course of the, um, the 20th century, the average rate of recovery seemed to be about between 3 and 5 percent. Um, so this difference in recovery rates uh, sort of formed a, basic, a fundamental puzzle. And there's a lot of research conducted to try to understand why the California population was performing so poorly as compared to the northern population. So again, uh, here's a speci some specific um, data showing you um, that difference. Keep, I have to keep wanting to point at it. So, so, so southern, so this is um, the red line you see on the graph is southern southeast Alaska. So that population grew at, at again close to a well, little, little less than our max actually about 15% per year for 40 years consistently after translocation. And then you can see that blue line, that's the California population from um, the point it was, for, it was first discovered in the 1930s for 40 years after that. And you can see a much slower rate of recovery, about 3 to 5% over a 40-year period. So these are very different looking recovery trends. And of course, the question is why. So most of the different hypotheses put forward as to why the California population was growing so slowly um, could be boiled down to either an intrinsic problem with the southern sea otter themselves, and this could have been, uh, it was a number of papers suggested it might have been because of loss of biodiversity, they just had crappy genes. They were just surviving more poorly, they were more susceptible to disease or, or other um, mortality sources. The other sort of batch of um, hypotheses corresponded more to the environment. That in California, there were just more stressors that sea otters were facing, anthropogenic stressors, including pollution, also just being warmer waters, more, perhaps more parasites, more disease sources. And so it's really more of a dirty, uh, dirty ocean or a dirty environment sort of factor. Either way, the idea was that either because of crappy genes or because of a dirtier ocean, sea otters were dying more frequently at all ages, and therefore the population was growing more slowly. <clears throat> so, we began quite a few different comparative studies, <clears throat> both in California, Alaska, and elsewhere, actually Russia, <clears throat> pardon me, um, as, well as, um, as well as other areas, actually British Columbia as well, to test these very hypotheses. Um, so, these um, comparative studies were all conducted using very similar methods. We would go out, capture a random sample of animals using these um, scuba-based methods tag the animals and collect a whole bunch of information on their health, their uh, morphometrics, um, and then put them back in the wild. Sometimes we would recapture them actually periods later to see if they'd, for instance, changed um, their status with respect to um, disease exposure. But basically we would then follow them in the wild for a period of three to five years, which is how long the batteries on the radio transmitters would last. And <clears throat> we'd go out and locate the animals daily using VHF telemetry, 
We would record very detailed movements, obviously survival rates, uh, reproductive rates. Also, we would observe diet and foraging behavior. That's something um, that sea otters are uniquely amenable to because of their habit of diving down to the bottom, catching prey, and bringing it up to the surface and eating it lying on their backs. If a person like you see here um, with uh, telemetry equipment and a high-powered telescope can observe every prey that they're eating and you get a really detailed um, idea of their diet and their rate of energy gain. So these were all the different um, types of metrics that we collected in all the different populations we looked at. <clears throat> and then uh, we put it all together. And, and this was, um, there's a, I'm giving you a list of papers here, um, which I don't expect you to really look at. The main reason I wanted you to see these papers was because I wanted to point out the, um, a lot of the co-authors here who were responsible for this work. So James Estes and Jim Bodkin in particular um, were obviously fundamentally important to a lot of this work, but there was a lot of people, a lot of students um, that contributed to, uh, to all this work. And so I'm, I'm not going to be referring to all these papers um, again, but the, these are the sort of the sources of information. And I'd be happy to um, send copies of you or send you citations if you're interested in any of these things um, for the results I'm about to show you. So OK, so we compared all the parameters I just mentioned, health, survival, behavior, diet, movements, um, home range size, a whole bunch of different things across populations in different habitats. Um, using this idea of sort of natural experiments. So we can both comparing northern and southern sea otters, but also areas in pristine areas versus highly built up dense areas in California, sort of dirty and, um, dirty and pristine areas to see whether that exposure to pollutants might be making a difference. Sort of a whole bunch of um, <clears throat> opportunistic experiments to see, to test those basic hypotheses. So what did we find? <clears throat> so the most interesting thing <clears throat> I think we found was we didn't really see any fundamental differences in any of those metrics between the populations we look at after you controlled for population density. So density dependent responses in sea otters are extremely strong at, at low densities and areas when they've recently been introduced and they're growing quickly. You see really high survival, high survival of, of all age classes. Um, the otters are in fantastic body condition. Um, they're, so they're much, they're bigger and longer and have more body fat all the sort of things you would expect in a population that's, <clears throat> that's growing rapidly. As the populations, um, at high density populations, everything was completely different, lower survival, um, particularly of uh, juveniles and younger animals, um, lower, so lower pup survival, otters are in poor body condition, lower rates of energy gain, more diverse diets. So these sorts of contrast between low and high density populations played out identically from Russia through, the, through Alaska um, and California all the, all the places we look, we, would, we compared low density and high density populations and saw the same basic patterns. But once you controlled for those density dependent factors, we really didn't see any fundamental differences in any of these metrics. Health and body condition are actually the same. And in fact, despite the, the general idea that northern sea otters are bigger than southern sea otters, in low density populations in California, for instance, San Nicolas, we actually found otters that were bigger and in better condition than a lot of the otters in Alaska. So much of that northern southern difference is like it was much less than we thought at the, um, at the outset. Density dependent and age dependent survival rates, as mentioned, um, identical across populations. And even when we looked at, at small spatial scales in California, in Alaska, in different places, we saw that the rates of recovery in these areas were also identical. So this idea that otters in California were growing much more slowly, it was the case, it is the case when you look at the entire state, but when you look at smaller areas of the range, they actually are able to increase at about 20%, just like they are in Alaska. Um, another thing that was um, similar or identical um, across populations is very low dispersal rates and very high site fidelity, particularly of adult females. Once females become reproductive age, about three or four years of age, they basically stop moving. They will stay in that in this very small home range, which might be anywhere from about five to 20 kilometers of coastline, and they'll be there for the rest of their lives. Some juvenile animals, well, juvenile females will move a bit, although some juvenile females actually end up in their, in their natal range and do the same thing, set up a home range and never leave. Males are a little bit more mobile, except for, but although not territorial males, but basically 95% of annual um, net displacement, is less than 20, 20 to 23 kilometers. Um, it's the same in Southeast Alaska, in the Aleutian Islands and in California, which are the three places we've been able to measure these sorts of movements with, um, with tagged animals. So sea otters are very high, high show this high site fidelity, very low um, dispersal behavior. So 
all of these things did not support either differences in sort of fundamental biology of the animals or differences in environmental stressors as being causal for the different patterns of recovery that we'd seen in between northern and southern sea otters. There is something that is fundamentally different though, and that is not the sea otters, but actually the configuration of habitat um, in California versus northern populations. In California, the sea otter population has expanded along this very narrow, um, essentially one-dimensional habitat. So that little thin sort of strip of orange habitat is all, that's, that's all they have in California. They can either move north or south along that habitat. Um, so that's, the population has been growing and spreading very slowly over the last hundred years on that one-dimensional axis. In contrast, in northern populations, British Columbia and southeast Alaska are, are great examples, looks completely different. Um, there the population has expanded within this very complex two-dimensional matrix of, of archipelagos, of islands, channels, and bays. Um, the little red dots you can see in this um, map are translocation points where otters were released in the 60s and 70s. And as you can see, they've since then they, since then they have spread out um, in all directions from those translocation points. So this raised um, this interesting question, and that is whether the actual difference in habitat configuration, what I'll call the topology of the landscape for sea otters, could affect the rate of population recovery. So that's what we're going to look at right now. And before we do, I'm going to take a quick digression into to talk a little bit more about density dependence in sea otters, which I've mentioned a bit. So K, obviously, carrying capacity is the maximum or equilibrium population density that can be supported in a specified area over the long term, given the existing resources and resource dynamics. But that in a specified area is, is kind of key, and it's often sort of left out. Some people obviously consider it explicitly, and sometimes it's really obvious what that area should be. It's the area of a given population. But in a, in a species like the sea otter that is sort of spread out over this very long area, it does raise the question, what is the area over which we should be estimating carrying capacity? Is it an entire region? Is it the entire North Pacific? Or is it something smaller? So K exists, of course, because the per capita availability of some limiting resource varies with population density. For sea otters, that limiting resource is prey. It's specifically, it's high energy preferred prey species. Sea otters have an incredibly high metabolic rate. Actually, it's the highest mass-specific metabolic rate measured for any mammal. So they basically, and they have almost no body reserves, no fat reserves. So they basically have to maintain this really high level of prey consumption every day. A very short, they can't even go for a very short period without this high rate of energy gain. So that is their limiting resource. Um, and reductions in that high quality prey are what lead to density responses. And one or more vital rates, of course, varies. Um, it's usually, it's actually, it's not reproductive rates. Those are constant for sea otters. It's actually mortality rates. And then the population growth slows and they reach carrying capacity. So this question then, what scale does K occur? So I want you to imagine simplified sea otter population. This might be the California population growing from some, an initial nucleus. So the population theoretically grows at, at low density is going to grow um, at a very high rate of growth. Um, ideally somewhere close to the R max. And eventually, as you get more otters, population growth slows until it reaches carrying capacity. Um, and that carrying capacity will be defined for this scale of the whole population. So that's sort of a very simple picture of a homogeneous, well-mixed population. We can imagine another version of the same population, but this time we're going to sort of impose some sort of structure to that population. This might be an obvious structure if it was the Aleutian Islands. The structure there might be individual islands, for instance. But in a continuous habitat like California, it might be cryptic structure. There, there might be just areas where um, the populations are cohesive and other areas where there, there's not much mixture of animals. Um, either way, we're going to do the same thing. We'll start with an initial nucleus of animals. And over time, they spread. And it looks pretty much the same as that unmixed population, but there's actually different things going on. So um, after some period of time, you're going to have areas of habitat that are still uncolonized. And what determines that rate at which those uncolonized habitat patches are colonized is the essentially the dispersal rate or the movement rate and mobility of individual otters, how fast they get to those locations. Then you have recently colonized subpopulations where you can have high growth rates. So they're what determines the rate of change in those, those patches is going to be essentially the intrinsic rate of potential rate of growth of the population. And then you finally have these long established subpopulations where you're not actually seeing much change over time, or the, the, the population might be fluctuating in abundance around some, some constant density. Um, and so in this case, the, the, that little path, we would say, is at local carrying capacity. 
Um, and this, this implies that the density dependent processes are acting at this small spatial scale. So the question then is, which of these scenarios better describe the sea otter population? And maybe you can guess which one I'm, I'm about to say. Um, all of our research suggests that it is in fact a structured population that better describes what's going on within, within a large regional population like California or Southeast Alaska. Um, and this, this spatial structure arises from two factors. One is just the limited mobility of, of females, of reproductive females, which are the demographically relevant part of the population. Um, the fact that animals, females that are even 50 kilometers distant from each other never, never encounter each other. They're, they're, and their pups may never encounter each other. They're, they're really discrete populations, even though there's no physical barrier between them, just because they don't move. And then the second factor is, of course, the fine scale dynamics of the limiting resource that determines carrying capacity. So they're invertebrate prey. They don't feed on any fish, except a little bit in the Aleutian Islands. Um, and, so that, and most of their prey can vary in abundance and um, recruitment dynamics and all the factors that, that affect the abundance of their prey and productivity of their prey can vary at relatively fine spatial scales. So the question then is, it, given this sort of um, local scale of density dependence, limited dispersal of individual animals, how does the spatial topology of habitat um, and differences in that spatial topology affect the rate of population increase at regional levels? So we evaluated this question using a relatively simple, discrete uh, diffusion model um, of population growth and range expansion. So you, the model essentially just tracks dynamics of population density at points that we distribute over a landscape, either a theoretical or a real landscape. Um, we, have, we allow for local density dependence. Dispersal rates between, um, between these points are determined by actual telemetry data, so the, the movement rates of, of real otters. Um, and likewise, the rate of range spread um, along a coast, which is actually also determined by the mobility of animals and the diffusion constant. So we parameterize these models um, from our data on radio tagging studies, um, mostly from California, but, but the, as I, I mentioned before, the survival rates and movement rates were identical for Southeast Alaska as well. So, these, so the, the basic parameters of this model um, are identical for, um, for any sea otter population that we've looked at. And then we evaluate the dynamics of this model, both in theoretical landscapes and then on the actual landscapes of California and Southeast Alaska. So I'm going to show you the, the model results. Um, first for California. So we initialized the model um, along the central Big Sur coastline, which is where the remnant population of sea otters started, um, or was first detected in the late 1930s. So that little red dot is their starting population. Um, and we then just run the simulation model forward. And we did this a whole bunch of times, so we have a distribution of results. And I'm just going to show you the average results. So this is what the model predicts after 75 years. Um, again, very, it's, it's a simple um, spatial, spatial diffusion model, so there's nothing particularly complicated about it. And we end up with estimated variation um, in abundance um, up and down the range. And this is what we actually see, the observed density distribution after 75 years. And again, these, these agree pretty well. There's some, there's some slight differences. But for the most part, they agree quite well. And again, I'll, I'll point out that the model was in no way fit to the survey data. Those are, those are independent, um, independent data sets. The model is just, as I say, parameterized from these very simple, um, it's a very simple model and parameterized from the radio telemetry data. So we now do the same thing in Southeast Alaska. So here's, and, and I've just, right now, I'm just gonna show you a model run for Southern Southeast Alaska, the Southern half of that region. And there's, um, there are actually three uh, three reintroduction sites there. So the model is initiated at all three of those sites and then allowed to run forward on the Southeast Alaska landscape. And after 40 years, this is what you get. Um, the prediction of the, the density of otters and the distribution based on just this simple diffusion model. And this is what it looks like, um, what the actual survey data look like. Again, some, there are some differences, in some cases rather big differences in the locations of density, but overall the distribution is pretty similar actually. And when you actually sum up the numbers of otters, um, the, the bands here show the model predictions, um, with the 95% uh, confidence intervals for the, for across simulations, and the, uh, and the lines represent sort of the mean model predictions. The points that you see here are actual survey results um, for both California and Southeast Alaska. And so what this basically shows is that you have a huge difference in projected regional growth rates 
not because of any difference in the, the underlying biology of the animal or the basic tomography, because it's identical and the models are, are, are parameterized in exactly the same way. The only difference is the distribution of the habitat. And the differences rise, again, as a function of this, of the difference to topology is the fact that in Southeast Alaska, th that rain spread is happening along this complex two dimension in, in all directions, basically around all the islands, up and down channels and bays. In California, it's only going up and down. And that changes the proportion of the overall population that is in carrying capacity at any one time. So the differences that just arise from the topology of the habitat combined with the low mobility of sea otters and local, ident local density dependence. So that is puzzle number one. This was, um, this was a rather surprising result to us. Um, it's uh, one we're still actually, we're in the process of writing up right now. We were not necessarily proposing that that's the only difference between these populations, but simply that a great deal of the difference in the, rate, in the rate of recovery, the regional rates of recovery between southern sea otters and northern sea otters can be explained simply as a difference of, the, um, of again, the dimensionality of the habitat. So I'm now going to jump, uh, focus in on southeast Alaska to talk about puzzle number two, which are discrepancies in, um, the discrepancies in these spatial harvest effects that we've seen on um, Southeast Alaska. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what those look like. So in Southeast Alaska, hunting of sea otters by native Alaskan tribes is allowed for under the Marine Mammal Protection Act for ceremonial and subsistence purposes. And a fair amount of hunting does occur. And, had, and this is, in particular, this, um, it, it began after 1998 when um, there were some legal cases that sort of evaluated um, this exemption under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And it became clear that hunting was allowed and they weren't going to, and natives weren't going to get arrested for it. Um, there was an uptick in the rate of hunting, and those harvest records um, have been kept. Um, so there are taggers um, who have to record um, any harvested animal and report those tags to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who then collects all those data. So we used those data together with, um, with survey data to evaluate the effects of, of this um, native hunting of sea otters on the population dynamics. So harvest intensity has varied over time and space, and I'm going to show you some, um, some data on that in a minute. And what we're interested in are the effects on the population. And these, uh, I, I'll mention that both the population um, analysis and model for South, Southeast Alaska and the analysis of the hunting effects were just, just came out in papers um, just this last year. So here's the regional trends for all of Southeast Alaska now, not just Southern Southeast, but this is um, for the entire region of Southeast Alaska. Um, from the point of translocations in the uh, 1970s up to the present, and as you can see, it's in a pretty impressive um, pattern of recovery from just about 400 animals in the early 1970s up to um, over 25,000 animals as of 2012 when the last comprehensive set of surveys were done. However, when you actually look at that rate of increase over time, you realize that, in fact, it has slowed. It, was, it began at about 20% a year. It is now slowed to about 5% a year as in, um, in the recent years. It doesn't, you only realize this when you actually look at the data. It, uh, people continue to describe this as a, an exponential pattern of, of increase, but it's actually, a, it's actually a decelerating exponential rate of increase. And it, it, given what I just told you about the spatial structure within Seattle populations, it won't surprise you that the cause of that deceleration is because individual sub, subunits of the population um, have been reaching carrying capacity, local carrying capacity over time. So I'm going to show you some trends now for specific subregions within Southeast Alaska. The green dots that you see in this map are the translocation sites. So these are the areas that were obviously occupied first by sea otters. And so I'm going to show you three of those translocation sites. These are the longest established populations in Southeast Alaska. So Yakutak. Again, you see um, initial exponential increase, but then leveling off um, over the last uh, decade or so. Um, the area just north of Sitka Sound, um, similar sort of pattern, a bit more, a bit more jagged. And again, these are estimates based on a variety of different surveys, both skiff surveys and, and comprehensive aerial surveys that have been pieced together. And then in southern Southeast Alaska, um, similar sort of thing, rapid growth, but then eventually leveling off is the Morella Islands area, one of the translocation sites. So now if we look at some of the more recently colonized areas, so we'll start with Glacier Bay, you see that obviously they, they weren't colonized until um, the late 1990s, 1998 really is when things began in Glacier Bay. See a really rapid pattern of increase still. 
Same thing in southern southeast in a more and Kiku Strait. Um, there's a little down tick at the end, which I'm going to be talking about in just a second. So when you take look at all the growth rates across all these subpopulations um, and and then plot them as a function of how long sea otters have been present at that location, you see a pretty predictable trend. Early on, when they're first entering an area, they're growing at about R max, 20 to 25 percent. That declines over time, and after otters have been in a given area for about 30 to 35 years, the population reaches local carrying capacity. Interestingly, we just did this the same analysis for British Columbia, and we found exactly the same pattern. So it does seem to be something that's pretty, um, pretty conserved across sea otter populations. So sea otter harvest, as I mentioned, there's been an increasing number of otters harvested over time. 98 was when the records um, first started being kept in a systematic way. You can see that those numbers, this is the, these are the harvest numbers for the entire um, southeast Alaska region. Um, you can see they're increasing in time, although, of course, the population is increasing as well. And when we overlay the population growth with these harvest data, you can see, in general, the harvest rate is more or less tracking population size, um, not surprisingly. So the per capita rate of harvest has fluctuated quite a bit, but has been, um, on average, over the entire state has been more or less constant. However, we want to look at um, this at, at uh, smaller spatial scales. So we're going to we're going to take a look at those um, per capita rates um, at uh, two scales for all of Southeast Alaska, and then for three subsections or subpopulations within Southeast Alaska: Sitka Sound, Kiku Strait, and Morrell Islands. That you can see um, you can see in polygons here on this map. So Sitka Sound is one of the reintroduction sites, and this is an area that. Um, we believe was approaching carrying capacity, although you see there, you'll see you see in a minute there may be some question about that. Um, but it's been occupied, obviously, for the, the, entire, um, the entire period for 40-some 40, 40 years. Kiku Strait is a recently colonized area, still growing rapidly. Um, near, it's near the community of Cake. And then Morell Islands, another one of the reintroduction sites, again, an area that we believe is approaching local carrying capacity, and it's close to the communities of Craig and Klawak. So those, lo those communities that I've shown here, um, Sitka Cake and then Craig Klawak, are the communities from which the hunters are, are traveling out to, um, to harvest sea otters. Um, that, these areas were all chosen to be sort of equidistant from a, a community where hunting is occurring. So here are the per capita harvest rates um, for, uh, for each of these areas. So for Southeast Alaska overall, you can see that there's, there was one really big peak in harvest in the early 1990s. Um, and that there was there was some, some social political reason for that, and then for it to discontinue as well, it having to do with lawsuits that I am not going to get into right now. But um, nonetheless, you can see that at one point in the early 90s, it did exceed 10% um, of of overall um, population abundance. But for the most part, it's been down below about 5% when you look at it at this sort of entire regional level. When you focus in on these specific regions, though, you see there's quite a bit of variation. So in Sitka Sound. Um, the per capita <coughs> harvest rate has been um, at or above 10% of the Sitka Sound population abundance um, for much of that period. Kiku Strait, of course, there was no har harvest early on because there were no sea otters there early on. Um, but harvest began very, very soon after otters first arrived in the area. Actually, our first indication that otters were in the area was when we started, we got harvest records from that area. So before that, we didn't even realize that otters were there. Um, and it's been, it's bumped up and down. Um, above 10% several times. And then finally, in the Morel Islands, um, the, the harvest rate there has been pretty sporadic over time, and it uh, and quite a bit below 10% of the, uh, the population abundance in that subregion. Um, lately, there has been slightly higher harvest, but um, I'm not going to cover that period. So what are the effects on, of these harvests on trends? So to evaluate that, we ran simulations using a stage-structured matrix model, and spatially structured in, and in this case, age and sex structured model, um, because we had age and sex specific data on the, on the harvest records as well. Um, so again, the, the age and sex specific survival rate, underlying survival rates were parameterized based on the telemetry data I mentioned before. Um, and we ran this model with and without harvest mortality being added in. Um, in Sitka Sound, so um, the bottom graph you see here is the graph that you just actually saw, which is the, just showing the per capita um, harvest rate based on those tagging records. Um, and divided by the estimate of local population size. So you can see, again, these, there's certain periods where you have spikes in that harvest rate, and I've marked those with red lines. And I did that so I can, you can overlay that with what the model is predicting um, in terms of population dynamics, both 
with harvest, which and that's shown up with the solid line and then the gray band showing the 95% um, confidence intervals or credible intervals. And then the scenario, um, if we remove harvest mortality, but we just run it with just with all the other sources of mortality, basic density dependent mortality, that's that dashed line. And again, the confidence limits with the, um, with the dotted lines. So you can see in this case, there is a pretty significant difference between simulations with harvest and without harvest. And I will mention that that with harvest scenario, when you overlay that with the actual survey data, it matches almost exactly. So it's basically showing us what really did happen with harvest. The dotted line, the dashed line on the other hand is showing us what would have happened if we could have magically extracted that harvest um, in a realistic way, but still allowed all other sources of mortality to continue. So, so basically you can see that these high harvest levels do cause reduced abundance, especially when those rates exceed about 20% of local population abundance. And the current abundance now um, in Sitka Sound is, A, it's less than it was about 10 or 15 years ago. It's also considerably less than what we would expect had there been no harvest. It's less than about 50, it's about 50% or more reduction in abundance overall in Sitka Sound. In Kiku Strait, um, so in this area, the har as I mentioned, the harvest started shortly after colonization. Um, in our simulations, they did not cause a decline. The population is still growing um, at an exponential rate, but that rate is considerably less than the rate would have been had harvest not occurred. So again, you, the dashed line is the scenario if there had been no harvest, and the solid line is what actually happened with harvest. And again, those, uh, you can see that there's the dips when there's the higher periods of harvest. And finally, the Morel Islands, um, as mentioned, harvests were very sporadic there and, and always less than 10% of the local population size. And their simulations suggest that there's been very little effect of harvest and population trends in that area. So the effect of harvest then depends on, well, on several factors. First of all, when harvest mortality was spatially concentrated and consistently high above 10% of the local abundance, we saw that it did have substantial effects on the trends in that given area, if not regionally. But the magnitude of that effect also depends on the status of the population. So if a population is already at high density and so um, experiencing density dependent mortality, approaching carrying capacity, then you can see um, a high level of harvest can actually cause a significant decline in that area. If the population is um, newly established and still growing rapidly, it's a lot harder to cause a decline, um, similar levels of harvest though can slow the rate of growth. So that that's sort of gives you an idea of, of the complexities of mortality, when the, of the spatial patterns of mortality and how they can fluctuate at very small scales. But I'm now going to tell you about a pattern of mortality that varied at very large spatial scales. Um, and we're going to move out to the Aleutian Archipelago, um, southwest Alaska, where the population is undergoing very different um, patterns. So I'm going to, uh, another quick recap of the patterns. So prior to the fur trade, 1740, otters were present throughout the entire Aleutian archipelago. We know that actually based on the records from the fur harvest because they were um, very detailed log records were kept by the captains. And so we know that otters were taken off all of these islands. By 1911, of course, there's almost no otters anywhere in the Aleutians. Those red arrows point to areas where we believe the remnant, the remnant populations um, occurred of just, you know, so, a few hundred animals at most. Then recovery happened from 1911. By 1970, sea otters had recolonized um, a lot of the major island groups in the Aleutians. Um, but you can see, um, so for instance, the Adrianoff Islands are that, that lower central group. The Rat Islands are the group just to the left of that. Those are the first two island groups that we believe had sort of reached local carrying capacity at, at islands um, by the 1960s or 70s. But you can see some of the other island groups um, are shown as um, white in this map, and that means that otters either hadn't reached there yet or were just reaching there in the early 1970s. So this sort of created this mosaic of populations at different states. Looking at this sort of in a very simplistic way, um, this sh the lines in this graph are just showing you the theoretical recovery rates of, of all those different uh, Lucian islands. So the earliest ones um, began to, re where the remnant colonies were left, began to recover very shortly after protection, presumably. Um, and by the early, probably had already reached their local island carrying capacities by the early 1930s or 40s. Um, the first really detailed surveys were conducted in the 50s and 60s by Carl Kenyon, and he estimated that a, a number of the islands in the Adrianoffs and Rat Island groups were probably near to or at carrying capacity. He saw, saw large 
amounts of density dependent mortality, starving animals in the late winter, and the populations were stable over the 1960s. So he assumed probably correctly that they were at, at their local carrying capacities. But then, of course, other island groups they were just arriving at, um, the, the near islands, they were just getting there. That um, the Atu Island was first, the first otter showed up um, in the early 1970s. So what you saw and by the early 1970s, if you went out to the islands, were some islands where they were at equilibrium density, some where they were present at low density, or very low density, or some islands where they were just not there at all. What we, one would have expected based on that history um, is that from 1970 through to the present, that pattern would continue. So the yellow band shows what we might have thought should have continued to happen in the Aleutian Islands if, that, if the same factors had have continued. But that is, of course, not what we saw. Instead, what we saw was a really rapid period of decline that began in the late 1980s or early 1990s. Um, and we initially believed this decline was just happening at a couple of islands where we had survey data. But um, by the mid-1990s, when we started to survey other islands throughout the Aleutians, we realized that this was, decline was happening across the entire Aleutian archipelago. And by the year 2000, when the um, Fish and Wildlife Service was able to uh, get the funds to do an aerial survey of the entire region, we realized that that decline went right from the near islands, so from Atu Island, right through um, the Alaska Peninsula um, to near the, near the base of the Alaska Peninsula. So it was a really huge geographic area. And from all the data we have, and I'm showing you here um, skiff survey data from, from four of the islands, um, we, have a, and we have data from a few, that sort of level of detail from a few other islands. They all seem to happen in synchrony. Um, so this decline, there might have been short, slight differences from when the, the decline began, but for the most part, it happened from the early 1990s through to 2000. So really what this represents, again, in a simplistic way, was a shift from very divergent patterns of recovery to a completely convergent and synchronous pattern of decline across this huge geographic region, which is very different if you think about it from the patterns of decline I was just showing you in Southeast Alaska, which were happening at these very small scales. So how does that fit into what I've just been telling you the rest of the talk, that sea otters vary in terms of demographic processes at very small spatial scales? Well, what we believe was the cause of the decline was the addition of another predator above sea otters, and that was killer whales. Um, we first began to see killer whale mortality or predation on sea otters in the early 1990s. Um, and a variety of, um, of pieces of evidence I'm not going to get into right here in the interest of time um, all suggest to us, both direct and indirect factors, that killer whale mortality or killer whale predation was the primary and possibly the only driver of the decline um, across this region. So what that meant was a rapid depletion of sea otters over a huge geographic area that more or less corresponded to the geographic range of the predator that was causing the decline, and that was the killer whales. And although sea otters operate at very small spatial scales, killer whales operate at very big spatial scales. So this decline initiated a very predictable um, cascade of, of indirect effects um, based on sort of the, re the pattern reverse of what had been measured at, with the recovery of sea otters and the reduction of um, urchin barrens and increase in kelp beds, all that happened really fast in reverse. So there, within about five years, there was a huge proliferation of urchins. Um, so you can see urchin biomass increased by about um, 12 to 15 times just in that five-year period between the early 1990s and 1997. Um, and that has actually continued since then, that increase in, uh, in urchin biomass. Grazing intensity, of course, then went way up and kelp abundance dropped way down. Um, and at this point, there's, uh, I'll be talking actually a little bit more about this in my talk at the brewery tonight, but there's almost no kelp um, left in the Aleutian Islands. There's, there are little patches of it, but about, I would say about 90 to 95% of the actual existing kelp beds are gone. So, <laughs> conclusions. Um, in the Aleutian Islands, what we think happened was a, just this massive switch from Bottom-up limitation for sea otters, what really regulated their abundance was the local abundance of prey, as I've been telling you for these other populations, um, to a very different scenario where they were that was no longer at all limiting their abundance. In fact, prey is now super abundant in, um, across the Aleutians. There's, um, their primary prey are urchins, and they're, they're everywhere, um, to a pattern of top-down limitation. And that shift from bottom-up to top-down limitation changed the functional scale of population dynamics and population regulations from one dictated by their, their prey resources, which varied very locally, to one dictated by their predators, the killer whales, which varied over this um, large geographic scale. 
And of course, that, ha that shift in the scale of population um, regulation has very important implications for the viability of sea otter populations going forward, which are now at, at incredibly low abundances and are now once again scattered in little pockets across the Aleutians, probably much like they were after the fur trade. But also um, has ecological implications, uh, particularly for the spatial heterogeneity of, um, of the food webs that, um, that sea otters are really important in regulating, which before were very patchy and heterogeneous across the environment, but are now pretty much uniform urchin bearings across this entire, um, entire area. So we haven't really fully explored <laughs> what those implications are, and that's it. We're actually working on a proposal to do just that. Um, we really were not sure how long this process was going to continue, but it appears that this pattern that, that we see now seems to be the new normal in Aleutians. They're showing no sign of recovering um, based on all the surveys that we're doing. They're continuing at these really low levels, and in fact, some of the smaller little colonies that are left are, are still blinking out. So um, given that this is, seems to be the new normal um, in the Aleutians, we really want to try and understand what that means um, ecologically. And finally, I hope that I've convinced you somewhat that really trying to understand Seattle population dynamics um, and population <coughs> regulation requires very careful attention to spatial scale, um, both of the of sea otters themselves and of the factors that are regulating their abundance. Um, and failure to really appreciate that scale and to incorporate that into our either conceptual or quantitative models of population dynamics can lead us to, um, well, to, to chase our tails around imaginary hypo hypotheses that are actually unnecessary to explain differences between population abundance. And I think that's all I'm going to say for now, but I'd be happy to take any questions. I would pay huge money for a glass of water. <laughs> Canadian dollar. Okay, I like that. Yes. Yeah, I have a question about uh, uh, otter population recovery or growth in a urchin barren situation. Mm -hmm. In urchin barren, the urchins are starving mm -hmm. and have no food value. Is that a viable prey to support population growth? So it's that's a, that's an excellent question. Um, yeah, and that, that's actually something we've, we've looked at quite a bit in, in the Aleutians, we're, and we're actually wondering the same thing in other areas as well, um, for instance, in California, where there are urchin barrens. And the, the answer to that actually is the same, whether we're talking about urchin barrens around Monterey Peninsula or around the little clusters where otters are left in the Aleutians, and that is they, they are exi exerting local, their, their local top-down otter effects in those areas. So in Monterey, for instance, they don't feed at all. And there we have tagged otters, and we're, we're, we've been looking at them in a study for the last few years. They're feeding extensively in urchins, but never in the barrens. They don't feed at all in the barrens, but they feed along that, that transition zone, right along the edge of it. And that's where, and we look at, we go out, we've done these sort of micro, uh, microsite dives right where the otters are. We see our otter specialist eating urchins, and they're feeding on gonad rich urchins. Right, right along adjacent to the barrens. So it's the same thing in the Aleutians. We've gone and looked actually at that right around these little pockets where otters still are. There is kelp and they're eating gonad rich urchins, but you go like a kilometer down the coast and there are barrens there. So yeah, excellent question. Yeah. Um, I once heard eating sea otters like eating an unbuttered popcorn. So if, if it is a top down limitation by killer whales and yet they're not getting the nutrition from their prey, would you expect that to be maintained? Is this going to be a temporal thing? So we didn't. <laughs> that's what, that's why I think our, we didn't really even, I don't know that we ever formally had a prediction, but I think we all implicitly thought that this would be a transient phenomenon and they would recover, especially since we saw, as the decline was happening, we saw body condition getting better, reproduction going up. So, and ever since, from you know, that point on, from 97 on in our surveys, the pup ratio is the highest we see everywhere. It's about 30%. So they're, the otters are huge and fat in these little colonies. They're cranking out pups like crazy. So we were pretty confident that they were going to you know, take a, do what they did after the fur trade, um, and that didn't happen. And they've, in fact, now we've sort of, when you, any, any sort of model you run suggests that they still have a, a continued high level of mortality. Like they can't be producing all those pups and remaining at these really low levels if there's not a really high level of mortality. Um, and there's, we've, done, we've gone back, we've looked for disease, we've looked for everything else, and the animals just look fabulously healthy. There's no carcasses appearing on beaches. So as far as we know, the continued source of mortality is our visits by killer whales periodically. So the answer is killer whales, are, I don't, we don't believe that any killer whales switched completely or even mostly to sea otters. 
the areas where they're eating sea otters in the Aleutians are where exactly where sea lions and harbor seals are. So the, otter, the killer whales that we directly observe eating otters, and we actually have continued observations of killer whales going into these little pockets of surviving otters and eating them um, in the mid-2000s as well, are areas that are really close to sea lion haulouts and um, and pretty, and well, sea otter, I mean, harbor seals don't have big haulouts like that, but areas where there's quite a few harbor seals as well. So we think these killer whales are basically making visits periodically to the islands, cruising around, going, you know, checking out, picking off whatever sea lions they can, harbor seals they can, and then making little forays into kelp beds and, and hitting otters. So it, it's not so much, it, it's more or less an issue of otters being caught in a predator pit, where as long as there's sufficient pinnipeds to maintain the killer whales, and they and as long as those, the sort of cultural grouping of killer whales that knows how to pick off otters can still do that, there's no reason to expect, I guess, that that's going to change. Um, or at least that's what we're beginning. We're beginning to come to that realization. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to switch to kelp. And, okay. uh, and not the recent demise in the Aleutians, but there are three dominant uh, canopy forming kelps yeah. that occur up and down the coast here. Uh, Macrocystis, mm -hmm. which you see down in California and parts of southeast Alaska. Mm -hmm. And then Ewell areas up in Alaska. Yeah. And then, of course, we have Ureocystis here. That's mm -hmm. the three otters didn't like their urges, their urges like all of them. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, is there uh, any studies done on how these affect the populations of the otters? Some of them are annuals and some are perennials. Right. You know, and, and that varies throughout the year as well. So, yeah, no, I mean, that's, uh, we've, uh, we've been having discussions about that um, today. And, and uh, yeah, devote, we think about this a lot. The, the thing is, the only otters, um, we don't have otters in the areas where there's only Neriocystis. So the areas where we have otters and there are Neurocystis, there are areas where there's mixed kelp. Is, and is that because it's an annual, do you think? So it's definitely, so if you go to areas in California where there's both kelps, they definitely preferentially will eat wrapped up in Macrocystis. Um, Big Sur is a great example. There's a couple, um, down in Big Creek, there's bed, there's a Neriocystis bed at one end and a Macrocystis bed at the other end. At times when Macrocystis is low and there is Neriocystis, they have no problem using Neriocystis. They, they, they go, and sometimes we'll, on, like, one day we'll go out there and there's the raft sitting in the Neriocystis bed. I mean, you know, like after, you know, 50 days in the Macrocystis, one day they decide to go over the Neriocystis bed. So it's not like they don't ever use it. They just, I think they just much prefer macro. And, and they behave the same with Alaria, actually, in Alaska, that they do with Macrocystis. Like that's their, that's their preferred canopy form for, for resting in. Yep, I know, and Alaria is really different. Yeah. I know, and and as far as feeding, it's we see them. You know, they feed along the edges of all the beds. So I don't know enough about the difference in term, in vertebrate fauna, like in a pure Neriocystis bed versus a mixed bed or a, or Macrocystis. And so I think I think from a prey perspective, there there very well could be differences. Um, I think as far as resting, otters prefer air, things that they can wrap themselves up in, and Macrocystis is, be, is sort of the best for that. But they'll, you know, in the absence of macrocystis, they'll wrap themselves up in, in anything or anything that basically prevents them from drifting, because that's sort of the that's their, the energetic benefit is that they don't have to keep swimming all the time. They can actually rest for three hours and not get blown halfway across the bay. So I, yeah. So I, I but you know, I, I think it's it remains an un, a, an unanswered question until we see them in an area like here <laughs> where there's only neurocystis to see. What, does that mean there'll be lower densities, or, or what does that mean? I don't know. But they definitely, I, I can say, they will rest in an area of bed if there's nothing else, or, or just for the hell of it. <laughs> yeah? Uh, you know, sea urchin barrens, that's very impressive food source, but obviously they do just fine in the <coughs> where there are no sea urchins at all. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you didn't describe, uh, and they don't have much fat, so maybe they start together to death and die in 10 minutes, but is the population structure or some way that you know that the story is food? It's not for birds would be nesting. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. How do you know it's, how are you so sure? Because it's, uh, capacity is food? because we, I, so I didn't get into the details of all the different metrics, but every metric that we have, and we have a lot of metrics, varies in perfect concert in conjunction with essentially their foraging success. Um, and, and in conjunction, when we have availability, when we have subtitled, you know, diving programs concurrent, we can look at that. So first of all, urchins, I talk a lot about urchins and everyone talks a lot about urchins. They're an important part of the story in the 
a very important part of the story in the Aleutians. They're also an important part of the story when otters first arrive at a place. Once otter populations are established anywhere from southeast Alaska south, urchins are a relatively minor prey. Um, like in, in central California, um, when otters are established, ot urchins typically make up about 5 to 8 percent of the, of the diet. Decapods are actually the primary prey. They're the icing on the cake. They're the first thing to go. I mean, when there's big gonad-filled urchins, that's the first, and they'll they'll take those down very quickly. Um, and then the remaining urchins are, of course, all become cryptic. But then they switch to everything else. Um, and they're and they, you know, the story is the energetic story is similar everywhere. Whether it's in a soft sediment area and bivalves are the dominant prey, or it's whether decapods are the, the dominant prey, it seems to be pretty consistent. The rate at which they deplete the prey, of course, depends on, you know, they, they can deplete uh, in faunal prey much more slowly. So in areas like a pure, uh, in soft sediment areas where there's very deep burning crabs, or clams, pardon me, it takes them a lot longer to really deplete that prey because it's just harder. But that said, you, all those indices remain the same. As the population grows, you then, and you see the rate of foraging success drops down. We can, we can actually measure quite precisely the rate of energy gain again because we can record every prey. We get their their little paws are rulers, so we know exactly for each age and sex. We know how wide their paws are. So when they're eating their prey, they can they're holding up a nice little ruler. So we get really detailed, size specific information on the prey. We can turn those into biomass and energy because um, we've sampled all the prey. So we can actually estimate kilocals per minute they're getting foraging. And every population, irrespective of whether it's an estuarine population and the open coast, soft sediment, rocky outer coast. And it shows the same pattern. They start about 20 kilocals per minute and it goes down to about seven, six to seven kilocals per minute when they're at carrying capacity. And that and body condition tracks that perfectly. So age specific survival tracks that purposely. So every indice follows this very predictable thing that tells us it's energy. For otters, they're I mean it's and it's not terribly surprising because as they say they they need this continually very high rate of energy gain. When they don't have it, they, they're thinner and they die more. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, so switching a little bit to the introductions, you know, when when they've been introduced to some sites, sometimes they take, sometimes they don't. Sometimes it takes a couple. Mm. Do you have any better sense now that you've been following these for a while of why, why they don't? Sometimes, like, yeah. How to it, but it, it worked or it didn't? You know, yeah. Like, yeah. And, wh and which one stayed? We, we actually had, a, um, there's an unpublished master's thesis on that specifically for San Nicholas, looking at which animals stayed and, and you know, what age classes. Some of, juvenile and sub-adult females were the ones that were that did better at staying, although again, one or two of the adult females did stay as well. But yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the homing thing is if you have an adult female and you move, well, if you take her from Central California to San Nicholas Island in a C-130, we found that most of them somehow know how to swim back to their to their ranges that apparently they can navigate from C-130 or something. But that's the, it was rather amazing. I mean, most of those animals that left showed up at their, back at their home ranges. So they do have this, as I mentioned, this incredibly strong site fidelity, which we think is related actually to your question, to the foraging. They, we think the reason they are so locked into their home range is they know every centimeter of the bottom. They know where every single patch and crack and crevice is and they're so locked into that for foraging success that it's there when you move them to a different place, you know, it's, it's, it's a bad thing. Well, males do. We've never seen anything like female defense. But but you know, to stay on, that's a, that's a great question too, but to stay on track. Um, yeah, I think that's a bunch of the translocations, even the ones that did um, take, there's evidence that there was pretty sizable movements of the animals initially. Like they were trying to move, like in the, some of the southeast Alaska ones, like a big group moved from Morels up to Coronation Island right off the bat. That um, and the Oregon, there's a very good chance that they moved up to Washington. So initially, if you take animals from some, especially adult animals, they're going to try to, they're going to move around and try to get back to where they came from if they can. Um, so that's one. So you have that challenge. Um, I think you know. I think this is an area there could be a lot of research to figuring out whether it's you know juveniles are the best ones to move whether whether the ones that the sort of the most successful it wasn't a translocation but raising rehab rehab daughters with surrogate mothers at the aquarium and then putting these, training them on the same prey that are in Elkhorn Slough and then putting them into Elkhorn Slough that's a they don't have another home to go to and b they you put them in a place and they know how to go down and get a clam or a crab and there's clams and crabs, then 
and they seem to, they seem to do pretty well. Also, there we were able to ones that weren't doing well went back to the aquarium, fed them up a bit, and sometimes it took two or three, but then they they took. So I mean, I think that sort of scenario might be more successful than taking out all the animals from one place and and putting them in another place um, where there is a good chance a lot of them will leave. But I think that's a, a ripe area for a student thesis to explore that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to go to something completely different. You mentioned a very detailed record from the fur ceiling um, up in the Aleutian. Mm -hmm. What were the records like for <laughs> Yeah, that's a, I've heard different things, including from a, a, a Russian who said that, who believed that there, the records suggested that there was a big area in Oregon that didn't have um, that where there, were, there weren't any otters when they when they came down here. I don't myself know whether that that is true or not. I haven't looked. I haven't myself have not looked at those records, and I don't speak Russian. Um, but um, this Russian person that said this seemed very convinced of that. But I have no idea whether that's so whether it's true or not. Who yeah, a number of people have gone through the records. Um, and in fact, there was a yeah there, there was a, um, a, stu a Russian student up in Southeast Alaska recently that was doing that for Southeast Alaska, trying to determine whether otters occur, whether they were taking any otters from inshore waters in Southeast Alaska, or whether that was an area where they didn't naturally occur. Um, but I don't yeah I know more for once they, I know that like there were records in California there you know strongly suggesting that they took thousands of pelts out of San Francisco Bay for instance. So I know there's detailed records down there. I don't know the Oregon case. Um, you, have you done, have you encountered any of information on that? I haven't. No. You have not. Okay. Yeah. No. That it's, would be a, that would be a, I mean, with the interest in reintroduction or that right. here, yeah. it would be something that would be potentially very valuable to know. Yeah. Well, there's we do know there's there are midden sites that yeah, show that there were like so prehistorically, right. yeah. yeah. But in terms of what was there when the yeah when the Russian yeah, ships first it might, arrived. It might give you yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean that, that's that's an excellent point. Uh, sorry, I don't know that one. Well, thank you very much. I think we're done.